There we go. So with regard to my blog entry, um, I have do been doing some historical building and um, museum visits, as I tend to do when I can get a moment to do them and to see if I can learn anything from those that went before us. Um, I have always enjoyed in my life speaking to the elderly. Uh, and I guess before long I'll be joining their ranks. Um, I've always found their life histories and their experiences some of the most enriching conversations of my existence and I guess trying to learn from those that are not with us but have gone before us and seem to feel that certain things are very very important is also something I enjoy doing and honestly I never expected that the research as we know would lead me to potentially consider that this was common knowledge across cultures um, in what one might call prehistory or possibly pre-cataclysm of whenever it was 11,700 years ago. But uh, I have a, quite a lot of material from the National Taipei Palace Museum, Taiwan Palace Museum, from my visit there earlier this week, which I will roll out as and when I can collate it and draw some inferences that might be worth considering. But I had to share this one uh, today because it was fairly early on in my visit to the museum and I was walking around these fabulous man manuscripts from, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred years ago. Uh, all illustrated incredible treasures of the former royal family, as one might consider it, or at least the ruling class of China. And walking along this particular one, obviously it's a Buddhist text, and um, you know, this is kind of derivation coming from India and these kind of areas, um, but it was a Chinese take on it. And it says, this is the Sutra of Diamond and Gnosis, genuine meditation with inner seal, being suddenly enlightened in the space solidifying Dharma realm. And uh, the illustrated manuscript was from the third year of the Zhuang reign, 1428 Ming dynasty. So getting on for about 600 years old, obviously this is, learning that had come from far beyond before that um but i couldn't help noticing that you know i have one of these things where i see something and i immediately see what it's what what's there and it was like i can see 33 rays i'm pretty sure i can see 33 rays <laughs> I was like, what is that all about because you know i saw those 33 rays in the third um degree supreme building in washington dc's in ex sanctum and so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, that can't be 33. So I'm there in the museum and I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and then I get distracted and I have to start again. And I go one, two, three. <laughs> Finally, I realize, yes, it's 33. So I hold up my uh, phone and uh, do a Google Translate of the page uh, to the right. And of course, you need it to the right because they read from bottom and right up and, and, and left. Um, and I was utterly shocked to see that the second from left, reading from the bottom phrase, said the 33 songs become the door of the 33 heavens, millions and billions of stars. Millions of billions of stars. And I thought, what? The door of the 33 heavens? What does this all mean? Um, you know, And is it connected to Masonic knowledge? I don't know. So I just asked uh, Bing a question, you know, what does this particular phrase, the 33 songs become the, the door of the 33 heavens, millions of billions of stars in the context 
um, you know, in fact, I didn't give it any context. And uh, it gave three options, but one of the options was uh, this phrase is related to the Buddhist cosmology, which also includes the concept of 33 heavens. In Buddhism, the 33 heavens are part of the desire realm. Okay, this this actually matches in with the Dharma realm. I guess that might be desire. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. This was just uh, an hour or two before I shared the, the link to this um, short announcement. Uh, uh, where beings are still subject to attachment and suffering. The highest of these heavens is called uh, Tavatsitizma. I'm probably getting that all wrong. I'm very sorry to those that uh, came up with the word in the first place, but apparently that means 33 in Pali. This heaven is the abode of the god Indra. We've mentioned Indra before who is also known as Sakra or Vasava. Indra is the lord of rain and thunder, and he is often depicted with a Vrajra, a thunderbolt-like weapon. So, <laughs> at the highest realm of enlightenment, uh, this is the realm of the god of thunder, rain, and in my view, ball lightning. How is it that we have come full circle in this journey? And that when you have the knowledge of the 33 songs and access to the 33, the door of the 33 heavens, does this give us access? Does this thing, this, this ultimate weapon, uh, the understanding of it, that it is, in my view, ball lightning. Does that also give us the understanding to easily travel to the millions or billions of stars that shine down on us as we sleep this last night of 2023? I don't know. Well, I have some news on the Thunderbolt. Uh, that is what I call the Thor reactor of Malcolm Bendel. They stayed on in India. Uh, Phil and Malcolm and another a couple of other members, they went up to Chandigarh and they worked with a team in, of Indian, in, Indian engineers to domestically build some, or at least one, a thunderstorm generator. And they had positive um, results today in terms of their testing, just in time for it to be transferred down to Mumbai, where official testing will begin in earnest so talk about getting the timing right so congratulations to malcolm bendel and film phil um the on that team that did that work along with the, all of the indians involved and com uh, who was also there in support so that's great great news and um, and that is not the announcement i have today uh, to make the announcement I have today is that following several months of to and fro with peer reviews, uh, I mean, they were assigned to us and claimed to be peers, uh, the paper that I co-authored uh, with a team of Taiwanese researchers and that um, was spearheaded by a number of years' work by Bin Zhuen Huang, who is a 50-year professor at Taipei uh, University, the um, premier university in uh, Taiwan. And I will do a lot more detail around the, the videos that I shared recently about that. But what I have to announce is that nature... Uh, scientific reports have agreed to publish the paper. This, for me, is a very significant milestone in the field of Lena, and it is the first time, to my knowledge, that a peer-reviewed paper has appeared in one of the mainstream major journals uh, citing cavitation transmuting matter. Um, so huge watershed potentially and not only that it is one which is 
incredibly systematic st systematic study that they have done uh, where you're only basically seeing these synthesized oxygen 17 and uh, neon 22 in case of reactors that are producing excess heat which they can do at will um, they can produce this so-called heavy oxygen water at will they have a neon tube device that allows them to see when the neon is being produced and because the neon 22 is the one of the rare isotopes of neon because normal neon is almost exclusively at least 90 around 90 percent uh neon 20 because there is no neon 20 and neon 21 this absolutely and cannot in any shape or form be considered contamination this ends the contamination argument for lena and um, based on discussions uh, we had there they're going to be using um sims for looking to see whether the synthesized sulfur is actually um sulfur 34 if it is then that would be the fusion of 17 oxygen and 17 oxygen which would give if that is in abundance over a normal sulfur 32 then again that would be extremely strong proof but one could consider that that might be some sort of zone refinement or some process refining but the the nature of the incondensable gas neon at 22 in exact in uh, exclusion of neon 20 and 21 is absolutely uh, frankly um astounding in my view failing some kind of error in the way that the gases were assessed um you know uh, it's um it's a it's a real big win for the community what i can also say is that during the process of the peer review i had lengthy discussions with alexander parkmore and he absolutely must be given full credit for sharing his calculated reactions uh, um, with the MFMP some years back. And uh, Philip Power in New Zealand must be given thanks also for helping me work with that data set to develop the MFMP's reaction, uh, Elena reaction calculator at nanosoft.co.nz because if it wasn't for that, I would not have been able to predict the elements that I suggested he might find under EDS in 2019 at ICCF 22. And I would not have been able to predict the elements and the gases that he would find um, are following his presentation at ICCF 23. And so uh, what actually has happened in the last couple of months is that um, the discussions around this paper with Alexander Parkamov, Dr. Alexander Parkamov of the Russian Academy of Sciences, made him reevaluate his thinking. And what he did was he went to um, uh, the original paper. So uh, I will talk about this in the expanded blog. Um, but essentially, there was this guy in the 1990s that corrected the error in mainstream physics where they do not um, correctly allow for parity in weak interactions. Um, and this is an actual a problem in mainstream physics. So he fixed that. And Alexander Parkamov has included that. Now, we haven't got this in the final paper that we presented, um, but we've got something that was al allowed us to get through the door. It's It's not perfect but it got past the peer reviews. So we're, we're, we're looking at this as a stepping stone um, and asking the international community to come up with other explanations because I think one of the explanations from one of the peer reviewers is, yes, you can you can do a normal particle physics interaction, but we need a proton that's traveling at 100 mega electron volts. And like, where's that coming from? And it's like, well, that isn't what's happening. So why suggest it? <laughs> but anyway, you kind of have to, what well, I've learned a lot about the peer review process. So um, in, in summary, I think uh, without trying to use a pun here, this is a watershed moment in the history of Lena. Um, a major peer review, uh, review journal, uh, I think it's the sixth largest uh, nature scientific reports, has accepted the paper that I co-authored 
um, with the team in Taiwan and um, that essentially uh, they took on board some of my understanding and actually they spent a very sizable amount of money um, over the last three, four years um, in doing these experiments. And it is, they have an amazing team and they are able to produce one new reactor design per week and put it into testing. I will explore this more in the coming week um, and to give more context around the videos that I've just shared. But to reiterate, this is, in my understanding, the first peer-reviewed paper to be published in a major scientific journal, uh, mainstream journal, on the subject of cavitation transmutation of matter and it also includes the pr production of an impossible gas um, that is 22 neon in exclusion of ne neon 20 and 21. Um, therefore, it cannot possibly be uh, attributed to contamination and the transmutation products essentially only occur when there is excess heat. So. That's essentially the announcement today. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I've got another 10 minutes. If you want to raise your hand or just chime in. Have you got any questions on any other subjects whilst we've got this nine minutes now? That would be great. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say, well done. That's great news. Thanks, Gordon. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah, you. There you can. Yeah, Thank because you. it's always been a problem with this uh, the peer review, because in order to get peer review, you had to go and get peer review with people who didn't want to hear the answer. So <laughs> it was always tricky. So that's great news that finally we got over that hurdle. Well, yeah, so I mean, we did submit easier. it initially to Nature, and they said um, that this would not be suitable for our readership essentially, completely flatly rejecting it before even, or I don't even know whether they bothered to read it, to be honest, other than to read it enough to say that it wouldn't be suited. I think nature now is is almost like a, it's kind of like a comic. They like short stories that are impactful and don't ruffle too many feathers, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, and maybe that's why it has the highest readership now, because it's, it's kind of easy to digest. They don't like too technical arguments and and so i i kind of understand because what bin and his team have done is a systematic study in a way that i don't believe has been done properly in cavitation um and they they have a lot of methodology in there that is hard to fault and very very detailed and and as i will expand they, they have a hand-picked team by bin uh, so, some of the phd doctors that are working with him they were the cream of his um, um students during his time at 50 years at the university so he's like picked the cream and one of the guys is the first official lena phd doctorate uh, current uh, in taiwan's history so this is actually a position at taiwan university the premier university um and he's actually got a, a full PhD specifically on, on low energy nuclear reactions. So I think that they're, they're, they're taking it very seriously there. And he's a well-supported team. And I'll go into more detail of that later. So th thank you, uh, Gordon. So I've got another seven minutes if anyone else wants to chime in on any subject. Okay, Nakata, yes, go for it. You can unmute and... Hey, uh, yeah, nicely yep. done on the uh, work in Taiwan. It'll be interesting to read that paper. I think I read what you posted beforehand, how they sort of went through all the mass spec work to correct for all the isotopic ratios and all that. But anyway, I, I was curious if there's any updates on the uh, wind hex work that you guys were doing. Uh, so um Tony Giaboni has been extremely busy, busy. This is what happens when you are volunteers. Um, so he's he's a brilliant engineer and his skills are well sought after. But what has happened is, and there are updates on that, uh, Hank Uren took the blowers and he showed that you could smash up cans 
it with a very simple device uh, into small small fragments and glass as well. Um, so at, outside of the main Windex, um, the mechanical with, with the same amount of push of air by changing the shape of the the fins or the the injector nozzles, um, Henk has been able to produce uh, uh, far smaller fragments, and that's without the heat and that's without the ionization and the moisture. These things, three things, I think, are absolutely critical. In fact, when they were powderizing and drying um, sweet potatoes. Uh, they would at least be above 100 degrees on the injection air. So I think that's totally necessary. And I actually considered this when I was walking around the town uh, to get some fresh air before I uh, launched this um, announcement, that I would like to see possibly some kind of injector nozzles like they have in the Armstrong electrostatic boiler so that we are actually have have a, a water volume that's superheated and then it goes through an injector nozzle that produces these solitons or uh, with charge separation directly into the airstream it might be a really efficient way of doing it and being able to turn it on and off at will so to see the difference in effect i also have one other concern that um we might need to have a specific resonant size or it, it's only resonant, and this would stand to reason, for a very specific set of parameters input like airflow and so forth. But it might be that actually there's an optimal quantization of size because the actual structures tend to have these quantizations. So that might be something that we might hit, hit a brick wall. That being said, he has used a lot of Arduinos and he's got... Um, almost the entire thing instrumented. So before we move forward with further experimentation, he wanted to be able to look at temperatures, moisture content, airflow, and everything. So he has, he's got these whole series of um, Arduinos with different sensors that we purchased. And so uh, we can do systematic studies uh, at different pressures. Uh, I, 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 I can give a hint uh, only because I saw it, but... Um, uh, I, I, I'm un, of the understanding that um, uh, Bin is actually uh, doing a similar type of version of his technology, uh, learning from that particular device as well. And in fact, um, Bin is, and his team are seriously monitoring any conversations in the field. And they are, like I said earlier, they are able to produce up to one new reactor design per week and put that into systematic study. Um, and so they, they are really fast cycling. They're totally taking it seriously. And as I will expand on later in the week, they, they are looking to have a large scale commercial long running uh, Lena reactor um, for, for, for permanent use at a, pre, a site that I visited, which is a, a, a a massive hotel and conference complex. They they want this to be a major component uh, with with a, a target of a minimum of a COP of two. Um, the whole site is going to be uh, carbon zero, um, but they they want this to be a major uh, uh, point at this exhibition center, so that part of the entire complex is powered uh, by cavitation heat. So they're very very serious. They've got a very good. Um, support from the Taiwan semiconductor industry, uh, in part because uh, uh, Bin actually invented the first high-powered LED. So he's he's serious, serious player um, with serious support. Um, and, and so it's just the right kind of person. And I, I would imagine that maybe, well, I would hope that the publication of this paper would um, allow the international scientific community to take the work of people like Roger Stringham, uh, uh, Dr. Roy um these kind of people, uh, and Leclerc uh, possibly more seriously, and and start their own, you know, even the work of Griggs and those kind of devices, um, more seriously, and and the 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 Soviet um, uh, radiation and and biological and chemical equipment, um you know, take those seriously and, and actually start delivering more kinds of devices. 
Any any further questions there, Nikita? Ben, okay, go for it, Ben. Hello, well, <clears throat> happy New Year. Um, happy New Year. <laughs> this bit, <laughs> yeah, I'm, in, I'm in Australia, so um, yeah, we're already there. But um, it's a bit off topic, I guess. Uh, but congratulations anyway. Um, do you think there's much value in uh, people who want to uh, sort of give a go at small teams that want to take take a shot at building a um, one of Malcolm Bendel's um, uh, generators or? Um, so at the moment, um, my, my focus for Malcolm Bendel's is it looks, it, it, when I saw the flux loops, for me, it was, okay, it's probably doing this, the, the process, right? So mm -hmm. I want to have a look at the inside of, of a reactor that's been running for some time. And then the opportunity arose where he had this one that was shipped over from Melbourne. It'd been running for about 500 hours across eight years in tests. And he yeah. says, I've cut it open. And he was starting to take some pictures and showing some twink twinkly bits on it. I said, Malcolm, just pack it up. I'm going to be over as absolutely soon as I can because I want to get some microscopes on it, expecting to see certain structures, and those structures were there. And and then I said, you know, he says he wants to put it in a museum. I said, Malcolm, no, please, I need I need some sections. You're going to have to forgo the museum thing just just get out an angle grinder and start chopping it up and send me some pieces. And to give him credit, he had the courage to do that, which must have broke his heart to a bit, uh, to to a degree. Um, and but when he when he when he sent it to me, it was just it was uh, uh, you know uh, very spectacular the the internal um, um, structures there. Um, it was. Um, um the the next thing he says is you know where do we go from here i said well from my point of view you you can go and do the test it needs to have systematic study and i know that the team in india are approaching that um and hopefully that will move forward you know i i have some potential issues with the, it um and i i've been very careful to voice those however um, every time you look a little bit deeper, it has all the signatures. So from my point of view, we are going to get, as I understand it, three configurations for us to use and to do our own testing. And so we will be able to have some kind of more independent view on, you know, whether it's actually doing the, the gas changes. Um <laughs> And then the the second thing is, I said, look, you, you know, I would like to have some uh, m the webcam technology that I, I I developed for looking at strange radiation because I believe that it's emitting a lot more than you actually see, uh, and so I need to understand that with some X ray film um, and and with, from the stubby way. So he made one. I said, look, I I, re I want to see that effect that you recorded eight years ago that got me interested in your technology. The, the the flux loop en entering and leaving because it's it's been quote it's been seen in geet and we've seen it in our vega experiments so okay you 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 got my you piqued my interest um and so he actually custom built a very short one um of the version which is the patented design so there is an open design which everyone's seen and then he's done something different mm -hmm. and the patent will be uh, submitted i think in the the next couple of days um, and then we, in the middle of January, will get, um, I mean, obviously pat the patent will be open, but it's it's patented that one. But like even the non-patented yeah. version was able to do the business, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah. uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would like to, he made this custom one and on the first run, it produced the flux loops, uh, of course. He, he he had a he only had an iPhone with him and he was doing it on the fly and he was getting ready to fly to India the next day and and so when he every time he went to do the video uh, the flashlight came on on his camera and so it kind of like saturated the frame so you can't see the thing very well but I'm very experienced in capturing these kind of things and so I'm hoping to go over sometime in January when he's back in the UK and do some much more study on that. So I'm I'm kind of asking people probably from my point of view because we don't know how far this radiation will come out. So certainly the flux loops that come out and go back in, they're only going as far as you can see them, right? But some of them come out yeah. and they travel around in the free air. And so we need to yeah. 
kind of understand whether there's any risk to that. I want to see the impact to x-ray. So right now I would hold off, you know, keep your powder dry, follow what's developing on it. Um, and, uh, you know, le learn how to work with an engine if you don't know how to do that already and, and so forth. So, um, yeah, I, I, from the risk point of view, I, I wouldn't say anyone should go ahead and, and, and do this at, at this stage because, you know, is it is it a risky thing? I don't I, I can't say for certain. That, that's it. So. So. Sure. All right. Thanks. Wayne. No worries. Um, so I'm just looking in the chat to see if there's anything. OK, so. If anyone else wants to chime in, do so. Okay, so uh, William Schwant thinks he's made a plasmoid, so I will have a look at that afterwards. So uh, Malcolm Bendel talks about a rare Vedic book uh, that Oppenheimer used to uh, to help his nuclear work. Um, I I will confirm on that. I have kind of something in my head, but I'm, I wouldn't want to say it. So um, I will um, I will get that for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, if anyone's if no one else has got any comments um that they want to verbalize, I'm I'm gonna try and um cut this and then publish it so that those that were not able to join onto the Zoom can get the happy new message, the, the, the announcement for the new year, if that's uh, okay with everyone. So if no one has anything else to say. Uh, so, uh, okay, so there's a question is, how, how do bubbles collapse? Well, it's a change in the pressure regime in the, in the overall environment. Um, and also condensation, things like that. So like when, when they come together, you get extreme heat, it vaporizes the material, produces a bubble again, and then that dissipates the energy and, and then it collapses again. So it, it's pressure and the, the actual dynamics of the process. Um. So uh, Leon saying, does the paper on Lena have any relevance connection with the work from International Space Federation? Don't know. Um, I will have to look into that. I will answer that in my blog. Uh, <laughs> Nikita says, yes, I don't know whether that's <laughs> relevant to that question. Uh, so uh, Gordon says he was a bit disappointed that Malcolm Bendel's work didn't get, even get a mention at COP28. It would have taken some of the sting out of the Petra State hosting. Well, um, I think it would have been a great thing for the Petro State, really. <laughs> it's so, yeah, you can't be everywhere all at the same time with these things. And I think, it, you know, in October, India used more coal than at any other point in its history. It also now has most of the dir dirtiest top 10 cities on Earth in terms of pollution. Um, India has the absolute most to gain. And uh, as I understand it, if the tests are successful in Mumbai uh, over the next four or five months, then there may be a rollout across the whole of India onto generation generators up to one megawatt. Um, and so this will have a massive impact on pollution. And I can tell you from first-hand experience over the best part of a decade, that, you know, one of the most disagreeable things with living in an Indian city is the horrible, horrible state of the air quality. It is just vile. And there are, to a degree, one might argue, a good proportion of the young children on earth growing up in these environments, and they've never smelled clean air. Um, you know, that is just horrible. They, they don't even understand what it's like to have fresh air. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the biggest impact that can probably be achieved in the shortest uh, time frame 
with this particular technology, if it really does what it looks like it might be doing, um, would be to get it out into Indian uh, um, towns. Um, yeah, Nikita, Nikita I, I agree. The lack of serious experimental testing has been a big issue. Absolutely. But I can tell you, Bin's team is highly skilled. It's large. It's well-funded. It's well-supported. I mean, I, 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 I was quite shocked. I, I ended up sitting at a table with the... <laughs> Oh, it's, it's it's absurd, but I had the, the two heads of the top universities in Taiwan, <laughs> the head of one of the largest energy producers in Taiwan, then two Taiwanese, but teaching one one at Nevada University, and on my left, who was the founder of the AI uh, um, society about eight years ago in America, um, and and um, the one on my right is developing solar panels that directly convert. Um, sun into uh um petrol basically hydrocarbons so uh it's only about three percent efficient at the moment but there's it's a good good technology because it's effectively zero carbon um but it's putting it in it's producing liquid fuels and and th there was there were other people at the table but they were all of the same kind of high caliber and then there was little old me there. <laughs> it's like, um and and then the the head of the energy company said like this ben introduced me as you know someone who's got quite a wide experience in cold fusion and so the head of this energy company asked me to explain how cold fusion works which i did surprisingly in about one and a half minutes to stun silence to everyone at the table and he could he didn't have a response so it was like okay let's eat now <laughs> so yeah it was quite a weird situation but um i i guess as we move forward we, we might have to suffer through some of those other situations you know and and potentially this paper and potentially uh, Malcolm Bendel's work can make a significant difference in moving the conversation forward, hopefully in a positive direction. <clears throat> so Ben says, one further question, have you read A, a New Science of Heaven? <laughs> I, I, I bought it uh, as an audio book uh, and in fact, I bought it so long ago that I'm nearly on my second uh, free Amazon book because because <laughs> I I bought it on the free subscription. But uh, no, I haven't read it or listened to it yet. Uh, I've kind of tried to find the time, uh, but it's not happened. But uh, maybe I can this week. Uh, uh, Kuki, the the um, the recording will be published, uh, and you'll see it tomorrow. Okay, so um, I will I will say um, goodbye, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, I I I think we're in for a really exciting uh, 2024. Um, I'm very very pleased with what everything that happened in 2023. I think it was uh, um, a transformational year in my personal understanding. Uh, whether anyone agrees with anything I've said, but that, that's a different matter. <laughs> but certainly, um, I've been able to make specific predictions since 2019, which have borne out uh, things like the iron-rich crenellated spheres in cavitation, that that was a huge, huge, um, absolutely extremely precise prediction. <laughs> it's almost comically precise. Um uh, uh, with with my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Alan Goldwater uh, in California. And I want to particularly thank um, Hank Ewan and uh, David Boutlier for their work over the last several years. It, it would not have been, it would not have been something of interest to me to see what Malcolm was doing had I not seen the uh, traveling waves in the Vega experiments. And so absolutely critical for the um, space moving forward that we pay attention to these different systems and what may be going on in them and and uh, really sit down and think. Um, but yeah, um, uh, thank you to David Boutlier and thank you and 
And and then thank you also to all of those people that have supported me in whatever way um, on Remote View by registering uh, and subscribing and sharing the information and uh, to those that have donated to the project to to make this work possible. So uh, you should all give yourself a huge clap. Um, and uh, well, I think we're going to knock it out of the park next year. Uh, so happy new year and um, uh, may uh, uh, fortune shine upon you and your families. See you later.